So let's move to the first case we have selected for the discussion. The patient is 53 years old, male, uh, he's right-handed, he doesn't smoke, uh, he doesn't have any past medical history, he just a mild dyslipidemia, he's a driver. One week before admission, he got a sudden onset of a left-sided hemiparesis, he went to the local hospital, and waiting in the emergency room, he recovered, so he decided to leave. One week after this first episode, uh, at 7 p.m., he was driving and he got a recurrence of a sudden onset of this left-sided hemiparesis associated with uh, thoracic pain. And he decided to go home. We take this period as uh, the beginning of the story, so we have time zero. Twelve hours later, he was not feeling comfortable at home, so he decided to move back to the local hospital, and he had this uh, angio CT, which is clearly showing the middle uh, M1 occlusion of the middle cerebral artery, associated with an internal carotid artery occlusion. At that time, he was sent to the uh, stroke center. So just uh, the local geography, this is a place where the Nourish Center, our department, is located in the south part of Paris. This is a local hospital. To go to the first stroke center, it's 20 kilometers, and it took uh, two hours for the patient to reach the stroke center. When he was in the stroke center, he got an MR, which is clearly showing this, uh, you know, multiple spot of uh, white spot uh, related to the stroke on the diffusion pictures. If you look at the flare, there is definitely a slow flow visible uh, on the uh, uh, right side, sorry. And uh, he has also a clot which is visible in the M1 segment on the Schwann sequence. The decision to not do any fibrinolysis was taken. Uh, we don't have that much information about this. So the stroke center is uh, 30 kilometers uh, from our department where the patient is sent and the patient arrived in Bisset Hospital. It's 15 hours after the onset. The niche is uh, eight. Under conscious sedation, 23 minutes after the arrival of the patient, the ground puncture was delivered. And then uh, the thrombectomy was started. It's uh, the material which has been used, a long sheet introducer arrow nine French, the balloon guided catheter cello nine French, the carotid stenting was done with a carotid wall stent 7 by 50 millimeter, associated with the dilatation performed with a Viatrac balloon 7 slash 30 millimeter. The microcatheter for the stent trigger was a Riba 18 with a guide wire synchro 14. And uh, the device used for the thrombectomy is a Vesalio Neva M1 system, 4 millimeter, 30 millimeter. The competitive device for this thrombectomy is uh, the catch, the amber trap, the eric, the preset, the solitaire, the tiger retriever, and the treble. An arrow 9 French has been placed in the right femoral artery and has been navigated at the origin of the uh, common carotid artery. It is confirmed that uh, there is a complete occlusion at the origin of the right internal carotid artery. Through this uh, nine French arrow long sheath, uh, Dr. Mialea is placing a, a balloon guiding catheter, which is a cello nine French. So this is the navigation of the cello nine French through the arrow uh, nine French. And then uh, he will be using a vertebral curve diagnostic catheter, four French, a long one. It's important to have a long one. And he's placing this uh, vertebral curve at the origin of the occlusion, and he tried to recanalize with the Teremo 35. It's a little bit hard, but here it is. The, the vertebral curve four French is now distal to the occlusion. The uh, Teremo guide wire is nicely seen. So we can remove this Terimo uh, certified guide wire and perform uh, diagnostic angio. We are distal to the occlusion, so the carotid artery is more or less okay, but there is a very tight uh, stenosis at the origin, so we need absolutely to reopen uh, this uh, origin of bifurcation. So the situation is in fact simple to enter you have to open the door. 
So let's proceed uh, with the vote. Uh, for that, get out the full screen to access the chat module to participate. I remind you how is the situation. The four French diagnostic catheter is distal to the occlusion. ICA is finally not full of clot. How do you manage this tandem lesion? Balloon angioplasty, intracranial thrombectomy and stop. Second possibility, the balloon angioplasty, intracranial thrombectomy, then carotid stenting, or direct carotid stenting and then intracranial uh, thrombectomy. So during the process of the vote, I have a question for you, Italo. Uh, this patient already had a neurological deficit a week ago, but decided to leave the emergency room because he was recovering. And now he has a second deficit and decides to return home. Once again, we see that neuro the neurological deficit is not scary because it's not painful. So Italo, what is your opinion? No, I mean, I think he's, he's a 53-year-old guy, so probably the guy has phenomenal collaterals. And maybe at the beginning when he had his first symptom, it was just the, this, probably this plaque in his carotid was just sending emboli. He didn't have an MCA occlusion. Then when the MCA finally occluded, his collateral circulation kicks in, and therefore he has just a, just a mild deficit. I mean, that's how I put it together. And we have seen this all the time. Before thrombectomy error, I remember very vividly this patient that was hanging out, hanging out with a with a uh, very minimal deficit and a complete carotid occlusion before people were discussing, you know, stand, uh, and arterectomy stenting. Um, so this, you can see this patient, especially young. So I think that's what's going on there. I mean, he has a, a, has a, has a large area of tissue at risk to save because of this collateral circulation. And therefore, it's, it's a phenomenal uh, situation. One question I have for you guys, I mean, is your approach is to, to go with this four French um, uh, gather through the occlusion. It looks a little bit uh, you know, aggressive. I mean, do you have any complication with that? Usually what I typically do, I don't know, and we'll ask then Mark and, and Vitor, I usually just go through with a balloon angioplasty because I'm afraid of dissecting or subintimal. I mean, is this your, you have good results with this technique, with this for French? So the situation um, which is emphasized by Italo is how you cross this uh, yeah. door closed. Do you cross it with a 14 guide wire or do you cross it with a 35 guide wire? To summarize, uh, Vitor, do you have an answer? I, I, do, I do cross with a micro catheter and uh, uh, a 14 <laughs> micro wire. And then um, I exchange and I take a balloon angioplasty and then I go up with a distal access catheter to aspirate the carotid uh, and see if there is any residual clot. And then I do a run uh, to check uh, what is the intracranial circulation and then do the intracranial circulation uh, subsequently. That's the point, but Mark, we found that uh, most of the time the 14 guide wire looks to be a little bit weak to cross the, the occluded artery. What is your feedback? So, so first, you, you have a balloon guide catheter that could uh, uh, give some protection in case of embolization. So even if you want to cross with a 35 uh, guide wire, you could do it by protecting, inflating the balloon. Uh, and I, I agree with, with Victor. I, I prefer the, to give it a first try with, uh, with a micro guide wire or micro catheter. Uh, I'm always very afraid of what uh, is behind the occlusion. If there is a complete occlusion, many times there is uh, a lot of uh, debris, fragment that you can embolize and shower uh, in uh, several arteries that are open. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's quit for a, for a while this technical uh, question. I want to come back on the first question and I will ask uh, in a different way to, to Mark. I, I summarize. This patient came a week ago and while he was waiting at the emergency room, he recovered, so decided to quit. Then a week oh. after, I remind you that this patient is a driver. He was driving, he got a recurrence of this uh, neurological deficit. What he did is to go back home. And it's just because the guy was a little bit uh, frightened and the next morning to not uh, recover that finally he presented himself to the emergency room in the local hospital. So my question to Mark, how we can improve the information? 
So listen, yeah, yeah he had a, a right hemisphere maybe neglect, and he was not 100% aware of what was going on. Uh, the way to address this is to be very aligned with your ER department and the persons that are doing uh, the initial screening. Uh, if they identified, even if it's a TIA that completely recovered, they should uh, do as much as possible not to let this patient go away and uh, call the stroke team immediately. And this is what we, we try to do, to work a close relation with the ER team so this doesn't happen. In my opinion, the, 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 the pain or the absence of pain is an issue. So, Victor, uh, shouldn't the absence of pain be added to the FAST criteria or have the sentence which would be no pain, less care? Yeah, this is a good point. But we, yeah, this is a, compared to a myocardial infarction, this is the downside of stroke. And you have sometimes these fluctuating symptoms that will come back in up to 40% and recur with a stroke. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, but I think the training, the screening team for any signs of, uh, of neurological signs and suspicion of stroke, I think this can be a good point. I understand that in your case, this patient was in a peripheral hospital. And, uh, and sometimes the emergency team is not trained properly to identify those early cases. Correct, correct. So, uh, can we have the keynote? Uh, on the keynote, uh, you have uh, marked the diffusion uh, of the brain, which is in relation with the tandem lesion evolving for 14 hours. Uh, the NIH is eight. So, the patient is in a very remote and small hospital. You receive the phone call. Would you accept this patient for a thrombectomy? Uh, yeah, of, uh, sure, sure, of course. The good thing here is that uh, there's not a big load of a, a core lesion, and uh, mm -hmm. I'll keep this in mind uh, when I uh, think about starting uh, antiplatelet. Okay. Yeah. That's a good point. I'm, I'm sure the guy has great collateral, 53 years old. That's, that's what's saving him. That's why he's lasting so long, because he's young age and amazing collateral, probably. And probably he had a, probably like a progressive occlusion of the of the ICA, so he has good development of collateral over years. So that's why I put everything together. That's why it's lasting so long. But I agree. I think in this case, you always think about antiplatelets. What should I do? I mean, should I load them? And we'll talk about that, you know, Plavix, Aspirin, Clopridogrel, uh, uh, Cangrelor. And then, of course, you're, the first thing that comes to your mind, how big is the core lesion because of the chance of hemorrhagic transformation? That's a great point. Victor, uh, would you perform a perfusion study before making a decision? We, I, I don't think for this case, if uh, you don't need, you use MRI, so you will have the core. Here we do CT and we do perfusion actually to find the same information to have the core lesion. I don't think perfusion in this case would add anything to the decision. Italo, same question. Would you no, perform agree, a, a perfusion study before accepting or not this patient, being transferring the patient? No, I agree perfectly with uh, Vito. I mean, this is a very scary situation. There's a cardiac occlusion, a clot in the MCA. I mean, these guys can go downhill every 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 minute. I remember in those days, before we had thrown back to me, I'm sure Vito and, and Mark remember soon, you know, these guys were in the ICU. You put them on heparin and increase the blood pressure. Uh, and then prayed, and then at 2.30 2 in the morning, they call, yo, the patient's completely paralyzed, no, it's not responsive, what are you going to do? So these guys, when they when the collateral circulation fail, they go downhill very fast. So no, I think there's no time to wait, just go and recanalize the, the whole thing. Okay, uh, uh, my friend, so the situation is, I remind you, you have just opened a little bit the door. So Italo, uh, what would you do, balloon angioplasty or stenting? Okay, so <laughs> I should I gave a talk on this a while ago, so I have like you know maybe like 120 slides, so I can give you <laughs> the uh, short version of it. I think I think the real answer we don't know. I think angioplasty is a is a good, very good way to open your door. Like your great picture, actually, if you can send me the picture, I'll use it for my next talk. Great picture to open the door, get some flow going, um, and then recanalize the MCA. But if you look at the literature. There are several papers published. When we published that stenting actually works better uh, before you do thrombectomy, there's a large series by Yadav and, 
and all on the 149 patients on the um, from the um, uh, from one of the trials, and then they they have from and then they and then they have in this trial they have uh, better outcomes and low um, hemorrhagic transformation rates when you do stenting first or because of the flow. But there's lots. I mean, there's no randomized control trial. So I guess I'm curious to see what Mark and and uh, and Vitor said. But in my, my mind, in my shop, we do angioplasty. We go up, open the MCA, and then take a look at the lesion. How does it look? Looks okay. Does it need to be stenting? Can we stent later? Uh, try to avoid dual antiplatelets uh, if possible. But if very tight, you got to do stent and dual antiplatelets. Okay. Uh, Vitor and uh, Mark, can you give an answer, but short, please? A short one. So. Yeah, I would, I would uh, angioplasty, recanalize intracranially, and then at the end, uh, check the, the, the lesion in the neck. And most of the time, I would place a, uh, a stent and do an expert CT to, to uh, think about the aggregation and, and make a plan. Okay, Balloon, Mark, what's your opinion? Uh, well, exactly the same. I, I'll try also as much as possible just to, to uh, angioplasty, avoid a stent. I wait at the end of the procedure 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and I do a, a, another angiogram, and there you can see if it tends to occlude or not, and you decide if you need to put a stent. Okay, so this is, uh, can we have now the result of the, the vote of the people that are following us? Um, so this is the, the result of the vote. 50% of the people, they would have performed, as you mentioned, balloon angioplasty, go to the brain and then stand. Uh, any, any comment, Victor? Or you, it's not a surprise for you, this result of the vote? Yeah, no, I think it's in line with what we were discussing here, balloon angioplasty and intracranial when the discussion of the stent at the end. I think uh, in the past we saw a lot of uh, colleagues putting stent first and then going up, but putting the stent first, sometimes you have a device that is not perfectly open and then you cannot use all the accesses that you want. Uh, you you. And then I, I think the angioplasty first gives you that latitude to actually, at the end of the procedure, decide what to do. Okay, the beauty of uh, medicine, it's a soft science. So let's see how it was handled, uh, handled this uh, first case. So uh, through this vertebral curve, uh, Christian is uh, navigating a Synchro 14 exchange guide wire which uh, uh, will allow him to uh, bring in the safe condition the stent that will be used. So this is the uh, Synchro 14 exchange uh, guide wire. So the vertebral curve now is being removed and uh, we uh, place the carotid wall stent, which is the 7 by 40. So to avoid some uh, distant migration uh, and because we have the cello 9 French available, it has been inflated. Carotid wall stent is uh, passing through uh, the, uh, the occlusion. Hopefully here it was not needed to perform a balloon angioplasty. Uh, the two syringes are placed uh, and uh, are connected and uh, put under aspiration uh, through the cello 9 French and then uh, Dr. Miela is progressively deploying the carotid uh, wall stent, uh, crossing uh, the, the, the lesion at the very beginning. You see the narrowing of the stent due to the stenosis, very tight uh, stenosis. The wall stent uh, is having a very important uh, radial force, but it's not sufficient. So we need to perform uh, balloon angioplasty. So this is the, we use the same guide wire. It's a 14 guide wire, exchange guide wire. Balloon is placed, is inflated. Uh, be very careful and you have to, to inform the anesthesiologist because of the potential bradycardia. So this is performed. The cello 9 French now is deflated. This is a control angiogram, uh, which is uh, perfectly uh, showing the patency and the reopening at the origin of the IC. Now we have to, to, to check what's happening in the brain. And within the brain, we are surprised to discover two occlusions. 
There is, uh, first of all, an occlusion of M1. You will see that later. And a second occlusion at A1, A2 uh, junction on the right side. So uh, Christian Miala will be performing the conventional technique of thrombectomy, which is proximal balloon guiding catheter and the aspiration and the stent river to remove the, the clot. So the rebar 18 is navigated all along the carotid artery. So this is the, the, this is the situation, an occlusion in M1 and also another clot in the anterior cerebral artery. So you have two locations of clot uh, due to the occlusion of the proximal uh, internal carotid artery. So this is the navigation of the rebar 18. Uh, you just have seen the synchro 14. This is the rebar 18. It's nice to use this loop, crossing the clot and uh, uh, removing the uh, guide wire. So now we are distal to the clot inside uh, the M2. We like to perform some selective injection to, to check that you are no perforation. And uh, we'll be using uh, the Vesalio Neva M1 system, 4 by 30. So it's a very specific system. You see that uh, the, there is a distal tip marker, which is a kind of very flexible uh, wire here. It is navigated through uh, the rebar 18. And uh, you know that uh, this uh, NEVA system is harboring some, uh, uh, some drop zone. In this one, it was performed uh, some two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, there are two drop zones. The so drop zones are designed to capture the, the clot you can see here how it is designed. You have two markers which correspond to the two drop zones, and this is the proximal uh, flow restoration zone that you have here, a little bit distal to the marker, the two drop zones, and the flow restoration uh, zone, which is nicely seen here. So nowadays, there are new versions of this uh, NEVA system, which are coming up to five drop zones to increase the capacity of the first pass uh, success. So the nine French balloon guiding catheter is now inflated, is put under aspiration with the system of the two uh, syringes. They are now connected under aspiration. And uh, uh, Christian will remove the, the Neva uh, stent river. You see here the distal, uh, the distal end of the Neva. Now it's coming back within the, the balloon guiding catheter progressively. Everything is uh, probably collapsed because under uh, full aspiration. Gently, uh, Dr. Miela removed the, the Neva. Everything now is back within the, within the cello 9 French. You have to be very careful when you cross, of course, the, the white connector. And it's always a matter of surprise to try to see if you were successful or not. Here it is. It seems that the, the NEVA system is uh, yeah, it's full of clot. So this is a good sign. Everything has been clean. And uh, you can see that you have a perfect reopening. It was a difficult clot because you have seen that the clot was at the origin of both branches. Unfortunately, we still have, the, of course, the uh, occlusion of the anterior cerebral artery. So this is the second attempt for the second uh, clot. Rebar 18 now is navigated uh, uh, into uh, the anterior cerebral artery over a synchro 14. You can use a digital zoom on the Azurian system. Here it is the, 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 the crossing of the clot. It is at the junction of a1, A2, and uh, Christian is, uh, Dr. Miala is advancing the, the rebar 18 distal to the location of the clot in the anterior cerebral artery. The synchro 14 is removed. A selective injection through the rebar 18. Here we are, just to see that there is no, no problem. And the same 
a NEVA system that has been used for by 30. Once again, now there are new version of the NEVA system. This is the, the distal tip marker. The, uh, the, the platinum marker, they correspond to the two uh, drop zone. You are here on the AP view, which show you where is the clot. I remind you that the clot is at the junction of A1, A2 on the right side. So uh, uh, this is a um, single shot. You see perfectly the two drop zone and the flow restoration zone. It's perfectly seen. On the AP, you don't see this is the tip, the distal, uh, the distal tip marker. Uh, once again, the, the cello has been uh, put under aspiration after inflation of the balloon, and the NEVA system is gently uh, removed. Removed from the, the cello, and here we are. This is the, the second clot. And there is a big load of, uh, of cloth which has been removed. Everything is, uh, is, is cleaned. And this is the control angiogram, which show uh, uh, Tiki 3 after one pass for both, uh, both cloths, checking the bifurcation of the ICA, AP and lateral. Perfect uh, reopening, absolutely no cloth. Expert City Butterfly is performed systematically in the department. And we obtain it immediately. There is a little bit of a blood brain barrier disruption, but this is absolutely fine. This is a follow up of the patient, pre and post op. Internal carotid has been recanalized uh, uh, after the stenting, uh, 17 hours and 15 minutes after the onset. The uh, angiogram uh, cerebral level was showing two location of the stroke, middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral territory, and this is what it is after the treatment, TC3 first pass on both sides. This is the CT scan, which is done immediately on the angiotate, which is not showing that much, except a little bit of uh, uh, blood-brain barrier disruption at this level. This is four hours after a new CT scan, just because I remind you that the patient had a stent and we need to introduce uh, another antiplatelet, so the patient was then at that time, because the CT scan was normal, put under tic agrelor. Pre-op, uh, the NIH of the patient was eight. Day one post-op, NIH was zero. Patient is kept under tic agrelor and aspirin. This is a nine-month CT follow-up, which is really showing nothing special. So to everybody, let's proceed with another vote. After acute uh, carotid stenting, when do you introduce a double antiplatelet? So you have to exit from the full screen. So there are three possibilities. I only give aspirin, never double antiplatelet treatment. I give double antiplatelet and immediate, immediately at the time of the stenting. Or I only give aspirin and wait for, we don't know, before giving the second antiplatelet. Please, please, to everybody, proceed to the vote. In the meantime, Italo, you don't have IV aspirin in the US, like in many other countries. How do you no. manage this kind of situation? So that's a great question. Well, first of all, let me tell you, congratulations for the case. And also congratulations, because your angio table is immaculate. There's no blow. When we do, I don't know about Vitor and and Mark, when we do blood, an acute stroke, it's a mess. There's blood everywhere. So I don't know how you keep it so clean, but really imp quite impressive. But anyway, regarding that one, we published on that. So we published on using Cangrelor, IV Cangrelor, which is a P212 inhibitor that acts immediately as soon as you give the infusion. And then um, Berlinta, um, P uh, T Cangrelor, uh, via the NG tube. But what we're seeing, especially with carotid stent, because it's a gigantic stent, uh, perhaps you don't need to do that. So we have recently, we just do the NG tube uh, because this patient is usually intubated and we give uh, uh, we give a Berlinta, a loading dose of 90 milligram uh, plus 81 of aspirin. We usually do it right away on the table. We don't wait. Um, I had cases of in which we wait. We don't have IV aspirin. Um, and we wait and we end the day after the, the stent is occluded. So that's our preferred approach now. It's, it's just NG tube with a load of Berlinta. Okay, just a short comment, Italo. It's not because we have recorded this case that it was clean. It's because it's a, a kind of uh, touch 
beset touch in the way we, 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 we perform the procedures. Uh, Mark, what is the place of uh, GP2B 3A antagonist and IV Ticagrelo, such as Congrelo? So, uh, for, I would mean, fortunately, we, we, we use uh, a lot of IV, IV aspirin, and I would uh, have started IV aspirin immediately uh, during uh, the after placing or before uh, placing the, <coughs> the stent. Uh, for, for these cases, we, uh, usually we, we just use, uh, we don't use other uh, G, uh, uh, IV antiplatelets. And then we wait, we wait for the next day to a, a 12 hours uh, CT scan, confirm there's no bleeding, and we start the dual antiplatelet, the clopidogrel. This is what, how we, do, we usually do it. So, Victor, uh, you can see on the keynote, on the left, this is before the thrombectomy. And uh, on the MRI before the decision, uh, you see that uh, the occlusion of the entire cerebral artery is necessarily iatrogenic uh, because it was not occluded before. It's occluded after the reopening of the carotid artery. Is there a technique to reduce this type of incident? Yeah, good, good point. I, I think you had the balloon guiding catheter. What I usually do. I keep the balloon guiding catheter in the common carotid, inflate the balloon when you will cross the, the occlusion, the, the cervical occlusion. And then once you cross, I like to take an aspiration catheter to aspirate the internal carotid artery before doing the first injection. Because sometimes you may have some uh, small clot uh, along the carotid that is being occluded. And when you reopen, the flow will bring it distally. I would inflate, I would keep the balloon guiding catheter inflated all the time during the cervical recanalization. Let, 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 let me okay. ask Go just ahead. a little Mark, Mark. Uh, Yes. Uh, yeah, what, what I would do in these cases of complete occlusion, because I fear that there is a debris, uh, I deploy my stent retriever uh, blindly in the M1. I do not do an angiogram. Uh, 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 to avoid uh, showering, and uh, I only do a first angiogram once uh, I have done the first pass, and I'm completely sure that I aspirated uh, all the possible debris. But uh, Mark, uh, uh, this is a very good uh, technical point. I repeat, you don't do an angio uh, in order to avoid the, to send uh, trombi inside the distal territory. You have to be mentally strong because you always want to do uh, this kind of angel. So you have a special uh, brain training for that? <laughs> no, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so Mark, I have another question. Uh, so you have reopened M1 on the right side, uh, which could be responsible of the neurological deficit. You discovered the second occlusion of the entire cerebral artery. My question is simple is, would you have treated this second uh, location, this second location of the clot into the A1, A2 on the right? Uh, sure, I would. Uh, the only thing I would have done different is uh, maybe this stent was a little uh, too oversized for uh, an A1, A2, especially with no intermediate catheter. So uh, I either would have added an intermediate catheter or uh, selected a, a smaller stent retriever. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree we, with Mark. Yes. I agree, Mark. I worked on the exact same thing. Now, the other thing I was thinking, you were very aggressive in opening the, the carotid. Maybe the embolization happened when you go with this four French cutter through the plaque. So something just to consider. And I agree, but nevertheless, I mean, this case always happens. You should, you do that and you do open the carotid and you have clot there. Um, but I agree with, with uh, Mark, inflating the, and, and Vitor, inflating the balloon guide aspiration where you do these maneuvers and then go with a smaller stent river in the A1. Okay, I would like uh, Victor to comment on the result of the vote. Can we have the result of the vote, how the, the, most of the people, they manage this kind of a situation regarding the, 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 the treatment? So it's 50-50, uh, my friend. Uh, it's, uh, one solution is to give aspirin and uh, wait. And the second, which is 50-50, I give immediately double antiplatelet. So it's a completely uh, democratic uh, answer. So, yeah. Victor? 
antagonic antagonic uh, strategies, but uh, I, I think we don't have a, a correct answer. What I think you did, and uh, and it's a, it's a good way to guide this decision, is the expertise immediately after, because we can actually have through the the uh, an assessment on what is the residual core, and if you have already a big stroke, you can hold, you can just start aspirin. Or if you don't have, as you didn't have, you can start dual anti-aggregation immediately. I think in the carotid, we don't need to be rushed to do anti-aggregation immediately, particularly after a case like yours that you open very well the carotid. I think uh, you have time. Uh, and both strategies, I think, uh, are correct. Uh, and uh, uh, there is no harm to delay the dual anti-aggregation in a carotid stent if it's technically the way you just demonstrated, in my opinion. Okay, we have to speed up a little bit. Uh, let's move to Dr. Cortese, who is managing the chat. Uh, Jonathan, do you have a question from the attendees uh, for Italo, for example? Yes, hello again. Uh, we have a lot of questions today. For example, do you require a general anesthesia before starting a tandem stroke? For me, Italo, so, that's so, we, yeah, so for me, I do. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, number one, because especially when a patient after TPA, we get lots of TPA in the States, I know if it's the same in Europe. You don't want to have the patient moving on the table when you do a stent river in the A1 because you, there's a risk of, of perforating and having a mess. So we use general anesthesia. And also there's data from recent trials that shows that uh, the outcomes are not that different, conscious days with general anesthesia, as long as you don't drop the blood pressure. So in our center, uh, both Dr. Dabusa and myself, as soon as they, they decided to go, the anesthesiologist goes into the room, and they're very good, and we intubate them. It doesn't take much, and you have a patient asleep. That's what we do. Okay, short answer, uh, Italo. Another uh, opposite question. If you don't have availability of anesthesiologist, would you refuse, refuse this patient? I'm sorry, what did you say? If you're an anesthesiologist, what do you do? If you don't have the anesthesiologist available, would you refuse this patient for a thrombectomy? No, no, of course not. No, of course you treat them. No, we used to do them without without anesthesia. So I think okay. it's the risky, but you can do it. Okay, no, guys, two other questions. Uh, short answer, please. Mark, uh, the, sorry, uh, Jonathan, can you ask, do you have another question for uh, Mark Ribot, please? Yes, of course. Um, do you evaluate the collateral circulation before performing the acute stenting of the cervical ICA? Uh, well, as I said, I, I, in this uh, specific case, I wouldn't do an angiogram, uh, so, uh, so I will hold myself uh, and I would not uh, evaluate the collateral circulation. But otherwise, I, I like to see, to see how, how there's a back, backwards feeling through uh, anterior branches. Another question, uh, Dr. Cortese, for uh, Vitor? Yes, of course. Um, do you think there is a place for other kind of uh, embolic protection device for acute stating? Uh, I don't think there is a place for distal protection uh, for acute stenting. What uh, we can do, since you have the balloon guiding catheter, is use proximal protection. So you inflate the balloon guiding catheter, then you have embolic protection. Okay, let's see three different technical uh, points. I want you to answer uh, with short answer, because we are a little bit behind the schedule. Here, the decision was made to use the classical technique, which involved balloon guiding catheter and stent river for the brain. Uh, Italo, any reasons to use distal aspiration alone or the so-called badass technique from the outset? No, I think proximal aspiration is good. I wouldn't do distal aspiration. It takes too long, and then you have to deal with the, with, uh, with the umbrella. And I would just do proximal aspiration like was described. With a, with a balloon. You have a cello there, so do proximal aspiration, inflate the balloon, aspirate. Vitor, badass, uh, distal aspiration alone, or the classical technique? Yeah, no, I think you did you did good, correct. I mean, I, I would do this, have done the same. Just a technical point, because you place the stent first, you navigated the balloon guiding catheter to the distal, at, at the distal level of the stent, so you could pull the stent retriever and not have any interaction with the stent. This is a good technical note to remind the colleagues if they put the stent, they have to be aware of the position of the balloon guiding catheter during the procedure. Correct. Mark, what's your opinion on this point? 
I'm a big uh, lover of uh, uh, distal aspiration with a stent river, so bad ass, and paying special attention to to place to not to cross the stent with your stent river, of course. Okay, uh, yeah, Mark, uh, any comment about the type of carotid stent? Uh, here it's a laser cut uh, stent, closed cell design versus a braided uh, two layers. What's your opinion? Okay. There is a third option that we use uh, uh, and it's not uh, uh, clear, but it's the use of balloon mountain stent, very short in the culprit lesion, uh, very uh, small amount of metal, less thrombogenicity. And we like to do it a lot and we fully stand with a carotid stand uh, over the next week. Victor, last technical point, short answer. Do you use carotid stand navigating over 14 guide wire or preferably over 35? Uh, 14. Wall stand, that's the stand that I like for, for stroke. The same that we are using for 20 years? Yes. Incredible. We do the same.